Okay, so so we basically discussed the um some basic idea about the DDPM last time, and also we have seen the long the derivation about the formulation, basically how exactly the formulation is like derived. And the uh plan for today is that we are going to see not about just like how we derive the formulations, but how we can exactly implement this model. So after the long derivation, actually you're gonna see that actually the implementation of like this model is surprisingly simple. So it's actually very simple. So you just need to like implement implement like just few lines of the code in the Python, then you're gonna see that actually it starts to work. So we're gonna see that. So like some brief wrap up, the things that we discussed last time. So we are basically seeing this kind of the ideas about like the generative models. So this is basically all about basically learning some kind of the data distribution. But since we cannot take the sample from the data distribution, uh, we are basically mapping, uh, seeing some kind of mapping from the latent distribution uh, to the data the distribution. So the mapping from the uh, the latent distribution to the data distribution is also called the likelihood, uh, the conditional distribution, uh, which is basically represented with our the decoder uh, or the reverse the process in the diffusion models. And we're going to have the other kind of the mapping from the data distribution to the uh, latent space, uh, which is basically our the posterior distribution. So typically we say that the latent distribution is our the prior distribution. We are starting sampling from the prior distribution and then mapping this to the data distribution. So it is like going back to the going to the margin distribution. And then we are having this kind of a relationship between the data and the latent uh, the distributions. Okay. And there are some kind of the key features in the diffusion models. So we started from the GAN and then VAE and just like moving to the diffusion models, right? So there are some kind of the key aspects in the diffusion models. The first thing is that we are basically having some sequential processes, uh, both for the forward process and also the reverse process. So basically when you see the mapping from the data distribution to the latent distribution, uh, we are having some kind of a sequence of the latent variables and having some kind of the sequence of the mapping process like this. So this is kind of the, the, one of the key features. And the second thing, especially for the diffusion model, is that we are not going to learn uh, the full process. So this is kind of like predefined. So we are not going to have any kind of the variational form uh, for this kind of the full uh, the transitional distribution, but we're going to predefine uh, this full process. We only learn the reverse process. So that's also kind of uh, the key features of the, the uh, variational diffusion models. And the third thing is that, uh, especially the diffusion models, we are going to match the dimensions of the all the latent variables uh, with the input data. So there's nothing in terms of doing some uh, dimension reduction or something. Something. So all the basically the data the points and also the latent uh, the variables are basically having the same dimensions. So these are the key features. And especially for these like denoising diffusion probability the models, these uh, the model which is called the DDPM, uh, we are having some more uh, specific kind of some key aspects. The first thing is that uh, we are uh, considering the fault and the reverse processes, especially the Markovian processes, uh, which means that like when you sample the XT, uh, we only care about basically XT minus one, the uh, some kind of the, the latent variable that we sampled in the previous step. So the every the latent variable has the dependencies uh, only with the one that has been sampled in the previous step. So if we see this kind of some conditional uh, distribution like sampling uh, XT, uh, conditioned by the xt minus one, the x zero, uh, we can easily drop the x zero because, like, we know that xt only depends on the xt minus one, but not the x zero. So this is only for the DDPM model, and we're gonna also see the case of the non-Markovian cases uh, in the next D lecture. And the second thing is that we are specifically defining this full uh, transitional distribution uh, in this way. So we are handling this basically some kind of the beta t here, uh, which is some kind of the parameter. Uh, and based on this kind of the some time dependent part of the beta t, uh, we are the defining the uh, the full the transitional the, the, uh, distribution as kind of the Gaussian form like this. So this is basically our definition in this specific case. And we can also choose the like this beta t as we want. Uh, we can basically consider like learning this beta t, basically optimizing this beta t over the training. We can sub send, uh, set some kind of the constant number for the beta t as well. In your the first assignment, uh, we will see the case that we are linearly increasing this beta t over the time uh, the domain, and we can also consider like some other kind of the cases for the beta t. And one thing that I uh, missed last time is that 
uh, is also important to have some kind of a very small number for liberality. So when you uh, have some kind of very small number for liberality, then we can basically guarantee that the reverse step uh, can be also modeled as the Gaussian distribution. So this is kind of the ones, uh, one of the key things uh, in the design of the DDPM. So there are some kind of the key, uh, some conditional distribution that you need to remember uh, to implement the DDPM also to follow some of the rest of the, uh, the part of the course. So the conditional distribution sampling xt from the xt minus one is basically defined in this way. And this is like what we define, right? Uh, and based on this de the definition, uh, we can also basically derive the formulation for the, some, uh, something that we call the forward jump. So even when you want to sample xt, not from the xt minus one, but from the x zero, uh, we can sample using another the Gaussian distribution. So this is like what we also derived last time, last time right? And based on these two, what we can also see is that even we can sample xt minus one, not the xt, from both the xt and the x zero. So for this conditional the uh, the distribution, uh, we can see that this is is also derived into the another the Gaussian form, uh, with some kind of the some complex form of the mean and the uh, the variance there. Right? So you don't need to like remember all the things, like you can just like download these slides for this formulation. Uh, the only key thing is that the mean is basically computed as some kind of the linear combination of the xt and the x0. So we are, if we have the xt and the x0, then based on that, we can compute the mean x uh, here, right? And the other way around is the same. Like if we have the xt and the mean, then you can also compute the x0 as well, right? So we are basically having those kind of the uh, linear formulation for the mean here. So these are like three main kind of the some conditional distributions that you need to remember uh, to basically implement the DDPM. Yeah, and so also in terms of like defining the mean here, so this is kind of the one of the key distributions that we are going to see, uh, especially in the loss function, in the elbow function, right? Uh, so the distribution of like sampling xt minus three, xt minus one from the uh, condition by the xt and the x zero. So in this case, uh, we can compute the mean of this Gaussian uh, using this formulation. And instead of that, like what we can do is that now we can see the xt as kind of a sample from the x0 uh, using some kind of the standard the number, uh, the sample epsilon t here. So you can see that like this xt is sampled uh, based on this Gaussian, right? So if we basically sample xt uh, from this Gaussian distribution, then we can basically see that this xt is basically some uh, another linear combination uh, of the x0 and the epsilon t. Here the epsilon t is basically a sample from the unit Gaussian uh, distribution, right? So which means that uh, if we have the information about like the epsilon t here, then we can replace the role of the x0 in this formulation uh, with the epsilon t. So what we are going to do is that uh, if we have the formulation of the epsilon t, uh, so basically the meaning of like this epsilon t is basically the unit Gaussian sample that has been used to sample from the xt from the x0. So what we are going to do is that we are not going to store the information of the x0, but we are going to store the information of the epsilon t uh, to replace x0 in this formulation. So basically we are just seeing like some, some different ways in terms of how we can calculate the mean uh, of this Gaussian distribution, right? Great. Uh, yeah, so what we can see is that uh, if we have the xt and one of those things, either the mean or the x0 or the epsilon t, if you have one of those things, then you can convert like one to the other. So what we have seen in the previous slide is that if we have the xt and the x0, based on that, you can compute the mean, right? If you also have the xt and the epsilon t, then based on that, you can also compute the mean. The other way around is also the same, right? So if you have the xt and the epsilon, then you also could the compute the x0 and also the other way around, it's the same, right? And also for the x0 and the epsilon t. So if you have like one of those two uh, in, in these three D variables, then you can compute the other. So these are like just a simple, some kind of linear combinations. So we are basically having these three quantities uh, in this relationship. So we can compute the other based on the one of the variables here. So you would need to remember this because we're gonna see like how we can utilize this information uh, in our the network training. 
So these are some kind of the key aspects uh, in the DDPM. Uh, and we will see how we can use in, uh, this information in to minimize all the elbow function. So also what I mentioned in the last lecture, I mean, also all the previous lectures is that like training the agent models, like is all about basically minimizing the negative the elbow. So basically how are we gonna basically minimize the negative the lower bound? And after the long, long derivation, what we could see is that this the negative the elbow function now can be decomposed into these three terms. And one have like reconstruction the term and the priority matching term and the denoising matching term. So we are not going to see so any details in terms like how we can derive these like three terms. But the key things in this elbow function is that uh, for the first term, the reconstruct the term, this is exactly the same term that we have seen in the VAE. So we can basically minimize this, the loss function in the same way, way that as we have done in the VAE case. And also the thing is that typically even we can ignore uh, this loss function because like this is like very small the portion of like this entire loss function because like we are having the this big giant the loss function which is like even summing up over the, all the time step dt. So this is kind of like the most dominating the parts uh, determining the loss function. So practically even we can ignore like implementing this reconstructive term. So we're gonna ignore this. The second thing is that this prior matching term uh, converges to zero without doing any optimization. So as you can see in the, the loss term, there is nothing to be optimized because we predefined the default process, right? So actually by our the definition of the default process, uh, if we increase the time step or like adding the noise in the default process, then we can say that this the key divergence like naturally basically goes down to zero the by definition of the, our default process. So that's the way that uh, how we define our default process. So we can also ignore this loss term. So this is basically the good thing of the like the feature model and the uh, from the uh, the definition of the DDPM, what we can say is that we only need to care about like this last the loss term, uh, which is the denoising matching term. So this is basically all about basically minimizing the KL divergence between these two conditional distributions. So this is basically what we are going to do uh, in the DDPMD model. So this is the main focus in terms of like design the loss function. And then now we can see this is kind of some expected the value from here. Uh, so here, because like we are taking some over the time step t. So we can see that this is basically expected value over not only for the xt, uh, which is sample from the xu, and also over the time t as well. So we are basically having some kind of the expected value of the KL divergence uh, between these two, uh, the, the conditional distributions. So we are going to minimize this. Okay. So the key thing here is basically how we are going to compute that KLD divergence. And before that, actually what we need to do is that, you know, we know how the, you know, uh, the, this distribution, right? how the, the formulation of like this distribution, uh, distribution is basically derived. That's what, what we have done in the previous slide. And this is basically the variational deform that we need to learn. So we are going to make a variational deform over like this distribution in a way that we can basically find a good distribution that can minimize this loss function. So we are going to find some kind of the distribution here that can basically, uh, the p set there, that can basically match the distribution that we are com uh, competing uh, for the Q case there. So how we are going to define the variational deform of that the likelihood the distribution? The thing is that uh, what we have seen in the previous the, the slide is that uh, we can directly compute the variance the the, the 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 variance of the Gaussian distribution. The only thing that we need to know is basically the mean, but the variance can be computed directly from the all the parameters that we already have. So we can use exactly the same the variance. The only thing that we need to do is basically just predicting the mean. So this is basically the part where the neural network comes in. So we're gonna use a neural network that can basically uh, predict the mean of that distribution uh, using the input of the xt and also the time step t. So this is basically what we need to do. We're gonna make some kind of a small neural network uh, which is taking the xt and the t, the time step t as the input and predicting the mean of that, uh, the you know the posterior distribution. So this is like all we need to do uh, in your implementation of the DDPM. But as we have seen in the previous slide, uh, instead of like predicting the mean here, 
that we can consider like predicting the other things. For example, like we can consider predicting the x0 in a way that we can just like compute the mean based on the xt and the x0. So this is just like another way. So there are like three cases, three the options that we can choose in terms of like defining the variation before. So we can consider having the neural network, which is not directly predicting the mean, but just predicting the x0 here in a way that we can compute the mean of the distribution. So this is the case that we are just having the x0 predictor at every time step. Just like another the option, right? And the third option also would be basically having the epsilon t predictor. So we also have seen that in the in the previous slide, if we know the x t and the epsilon t, then based on that we can also compute the mean, right? So instead of like having the mean predictor or the x zero predictor, now we can have the epsilon t predictor to compute the mean here. So here the key thing is that like whatever we have, like whether we have some mean prediction or the x zero prediction or the epsilon t prediction, uh, we can compute the other things based on the information that we have. So it's just like matter of like changing the variables here in terms of like what we are going to predict. Uh, not making some kind of the big difference uh, in the DPMD training, but still making some small difference. Uh, so yeah, so we can consider these three options. Like one is directly predicting the mean of the distribution. And the other option is to predict the X zero and then computing mean based on that. And having the uh, epsilon T predictor and computing mean based on that like three options. You can see like this might look kind of complicated, but this is just like nothing but just like you know, changing the variables. So we are just like either taking the mean or the x0 and the epsilon t as some kind of the variables that we are going to predict using the neural net. Then based on that, we can compute the other. So it's just like matter of like just doing some very simple deep calculation uh, in your code. Any questions on this? I'm going to explain that. Yeah. So yeah, so based on these like one of the, the predictors, so how we are uh, exactly going to minimize this term? So this is kind of the main part in the training, right? So, so what we have seen in the previous lecture is that these KLD divergence term can be uh, rewritten uh, into this very simple the L2 loss. So this is nothing basically just like minimizing this kind of the L2 difference between the uh, ground truth, the, the some kind of the mean that we know, uh, with some kind of the mean that we are going to predict, where we can also define the L2, the, the loss uh, for the X0, where we can define the L2 loss for the Epsilon0. So here also the, the thing is that there is like nothing changed. Like everything is basically just like minimizing the L2 loss, uh, except for that we are just like having some different ways. So the only things when you change the, the predictor is basically just like changing the weight. Uh, in the lowest functions. So these are only things that we need to change. And even better thing is that in practice, uh, there's no theory here, but the, in practice, what we can say is that uh, even we can just like ignore the weight. You just need to minimize the L to loss. I mean, this is just like some practical kind of things. I mean, there's not, no, no theory here, but uh, if you implement your neural network, even when you basically just like ignore the weight term, uh, it still works well. So even we are going to ignore all the weight terms here, then you can see that all the loss function here becomes like identical in terms of just like minimizing the L2 loss. Which means like, it sounds like whether you have the mean predictor, x0 predictor, is t predictor, everything is the same. Right, everything is the same. So it's like just up to you, you can choose like anything, any of like those kind of objects. Okay. So typically, what we can see in many kind of some pre-trained, uh, some diffusion model is basically we can see some cases like having the x0 predictor, but most of the cases actually we can see the like epsilon t predictor. So the only reason like why we uh, might want to use the epsilon t predictor is that we know that all the epsilon value here are basically the standard the normal samples. And if you have any experience in the neural net some training, then you will know that like data normalization is the key part in the to improve the quality of the, the outputs of the, the uh the predictions. So what you can see is that since all the epsilon t are the standard the normal the samples, these are really well normalized and scaled the values. Everything is basically like normalized in terms of having the uh zero mean and having the unit variance, right? So you can see actually this is kind of the case that we are having some good normalization of the data that we are going to predict. 
so we, so that's the typical some practical reason in terms of like why we can uh, have some kind of the better performance uh, with the Epson T predictor. Very practically, but in terms of the formulation, there's nothing different. Uh, different in, in terms of like you know which predictor you choose. Okay. So in the your the first assignment, uh, the problem might be about uh, implementing this uh, using the Epson T predictor. But I also recommend you to try to use the other the predictor, implementing the other predictor and see how much it makes some kind of difference in terms of the performance. Okay. So yeah, so here the thing is that, so now we are going to see that this is basically the the loss function. And given the loss function, so how exactly we are going to train our the epsilon t predictor. So this is kind of key part, and you see that actually this is like really simple. I mean, basically, it's more all about basically minimizing that expected value, uh, expected value over the time step the t, and also the xt, which is sampled from the x0, right? So what we are going to do is that we are first going to sample the x0. Sampling x0 basically means that we are just taking some random input data, some random real image or something that is basically some kind of given data, right? So we are basically taking any random the x0. So in the image generation, the x0 can be some kind of the given one of the real images, right? And then based on that, uh, we're gonna also sample the time step t, which is basically choosing any of the, the time step there. And then we're sampling the unique Gaussian sample. And based on that, we can now compute the xt. So basically here, the meaning of like computing the xt uh, is basically we are sampling xt uh, from that uh, the you know the the conditional distribution. So we can say that basically the meaning of like this two three four step is basically sampling the xt from the given x zero, right? So this is the reparameterization trick that we have seen in the previous lectures. So what we can do in terms of like having any some kind of the arbitrary the Gaussian distribution is that we first basically sample any of the standard the normal the sample and then compute this right? yeah, with the mean and the variance. So this is basically nothing, but basically we are sampling xt from the x0. And based on that, now we have all the information about the epsilon t and the xt and the t, and then we can just like uh, run the back propagation uh, through the L2 loss field. So the meaning of this is that uh, from starting from the x0 there, we basically do some kind of the full jump to the xt with some arbitrary the time step t, uh, and also the standard the normal the sample here. And then we will be able to basically, uh, and then we're gonna get the xt here, right? And now we are basically doing some kind of the reverse engineering in terms of like guessing like what was the epsilon t that has been used to jump from the x0 to the xt without the information of the x0, but by only seeing the xt and the times t. So we jumped from the x0 to the xt with some kind of the standard normal sample epsilon t here. And now we are basically forgetting the information of the x0. We don't know about the x0. We only know about the xt. And we want to predict the epsilon t, t that has been used uh, for the jumping from the x0 to the xt by only seeing the xt. Simply speaking, uh, this is basically what we are going to do. Uh, and then we are basically running the back propagation uh, through the, the values. And this is actually not exactly just like memorizing the epsilon t that has been used from the x0 to the xt because Actually, we are not minimizing this just like L2 loss for this case, but actually we are minimizing the expected value. So which means that for any of the xt, actually there can be some multiple x0 that could result in like jumping to that specific xt. So which means that you no, know, for each of the like single the xt, there could be multiple x0 that could lead to that xt jumping, right? Which means that also there came some multiple epsilon t that also led to that you know, xt, right? So we are basically minimizing the expected value, basically just like finding some kind of the mean of like those kind of things. So there is not exactly about like memorizing the exact epsilon t, but basically minimizing that expected value. Okay. So it's not exactly the same. But as you can see, like this is like just really just like few lines of the code in the Python. It's just like everything here is just like the one line. You just need to take like one input data and just like sampling t. This is something you can just like have some uh, uniform sampling the function code uh, in the PyTorch. And also the normal uh, sampling is just like one line of the code and just like calculating this and running the backflow. So you can see that this is like really simple 
uh, kind of things in terms of like implementation. So this is kind of some very magical things of the DDPM in terms of that. The derivation was very long. We have seen lots of things in the, the formulation, but at the end, like it turns out that you know, we are basically having some very simple de pseudo code uh, in terms of like making some training code of the DDPM. We will see that actually this implementation is, is much simpler than the GAN or the VA. So once we basically train our basically uh, the Epsilon T predictor, based on that, how we can basically run the uh, reverse process in terms of doing some kind of generation. I mean, the reverse process is basically nothing but basically sequentially sampling the XT uh, from the previous step. So what we're going to do is that we know that our the prior distribution is the standard the normal distribution. So from the, stand, the prior distribution, the standard normal there, we're going to first sample the X capital T there. And then we are sequentially sampling XT, XT minus one from the each of the XT. So this is again basically nothing but basically sampling the XT, so XT minus one there uh, from the XT here. And, and for that, what we are doing is that we are first calculating the mean and also sampling another the standard the normal the, the sample there. And then basically using the reparameterization tree in terms of calculating the XT minus one. So it's like repeating this process uh, with the uh, given the amount of the, the time steps. Then we're gonna get some kind of results, so like making uh, some kind of realistic the data for that. Okay. So these are basically kind of the some algorithm that you will need to implement in the form. So yeah, the long story short, the key thing is that while there are just like lots of the derivations, uh, you're gonna see that actually the implementation of the, like the training and the generation is like way simpler than the formulations that we have seen. Yeah, so here also one key thing is that we are having the epsilon predictor there. And as I said uh, in the previous slide, if we have the xt and the epsilon t, uh, the prediction of the epsilon t, based on that, we can also have the prediction of the x0 as well. It's just a matter of like just calculating the x0 from the xt and the epsilon t. But actually, you need to see that actually x0 is something that we want to eventually get, right? So over the reverse process, starting from the x capital T, we are going down to the x0. So x0 is something that we really want to predict at the end, right? But what we are seeing here is that actually what we are doing every time step is basically having some kind of the prediction of the x0 that we want to see at the end. So what you can see from this is that actually this whole process can be seen as kind of some denoising the process, but it can be also seen as basically defining the prediction of the X0. So every step we are going to have some prediction of the X0, but we are going to refine this X0 in a way that we can get some better X0. So I think this figure slide might be showing some kind of the clear picture of like what we are doing. So this is basically some kind of the images of the XT. You can see that we are starting from some kind of pure noise and then deducting some kind of noise in terms of making some more realistic images. The first rule is basically some visualization of the XT. Make sense? So starting from the pure Gaussian noise and basically making it, like denoising it into some more realistic image. And this is nothing but just like calculating the XU uh, from the prediction of the Epsilon T and the XT. So it's just, it's just matter of like, just like calculating this XU of the prediction from the XT and the Epsilon T that we predicted. So if you just like calculate this, you're gonna see that actually this is basically making some kind of the realistic images, uh, starting from some kind of some blurry images, but making it more like some fine images. So you can see that actually this process, the whole process can be seen as like, actually we are predicting the X0 every step, but we are just like refining this X0 in terms of like getting some kind of the better quality of the outputs. So since we are having some kind of the last of these steps, to improve this quality, uh, we can get some kind of the better results than some kind of the one step degeneration like the VA. And we're gonna get into some more details about like you know, what's the meaning of like this DDPM and also how we can even like make it faster in the next lecture. But these are some kind of the, some, the basic ideas, like some kind of the recipe that you can just like use uh, to implement it in the DDPM. Any questions on this? Why do you sample t from a new form of security in training? Uh, because like uh, if we go back to the loss function here, oh, where is it? 
Yeah. So the loss function here was basically taking the sum over the time step t to from the two to the theta t, right? So we just like converted this into the some expected value. So this is the case like when you are basically having the sample the t in the some uniform distribution because we are taking the sum over the all the time step. So yeah, it comes from the definition of like this denoising dimension. Any other questions? So I guess you might have some better ideas like all the things while you implement this DDPM yourself. And the first assignment will be basically, sorry. Yeah, I'm gonna just like switch the session, but the first assignment will be basically implement this, this DDPM for the two cases. Like one is will be basically simple, some 2D point generation, and the other task might will be the image generation. So our TA will explain the details about the first assignment. Now, uh, just one second, let me just pass you the... Okay, so can people on the Zoom side hear my voice? Is it okay? Is the audio okay? <laughs> 